When people try to change who they are, sometimes it rubs people the wrong way. They think, wait, who are you? Or what, you think you're better than me? Or you don't need to change, you're great. And, and I think that can be one of the challenges is there is peer pressure. And it takes a level of courage to, to change. Well, welcome back, everyone. You are listening to the Sparks of Gratitude podcast, where we explore the roots of happiness one story at a time. We are excited to see you. I am your host, Randy Sparks, and we are even more excited for our wonderful guest today, husband, father, friend, author, business coach, and just all around amazing human, Nathan Tanner. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. That's a lot to live up to, but uh, I'm excited to spend some time well, good. with you. You, you today, got Randy. 45 minutes to prove me right. Don't let me down. <laughs> Let's yeah, do I, it. I don't think you will. So I've known Nathan for, I, well, I met Nathan less than a year ago. Another friend of mine who I trust immensely introduced me to Nathan, actually, so that I could hire Nathan as a coach for myself. So that might come up in our conversation today, that how impactful he's been in my life. And hopefully you'll learn some of the wonderful tools that he has to share. So Nathan, how are you doing? I'm doing well. It's funny being on the, the other side of this, where normally I'm the one asking you questions and pushing you for insights. And now I get to be on the on the other side. So I'm excited. Yeah, to Yeah, that's in. interesting. Before we started recording this, Nathan and I were having our little kind of giggling and banter saying, well, I, I'm used to as Nathan acting as a coach for me, <laughs> asking me the questions and digging deep and challenging my assumptions and so on. And so now we get to talk a little bit with Nathan about, well, how did he become a coach? And, and why are these things so meaningful to him? And and of course, we're going to end up talking about a book that Nathan just, well, that is coming out this week, right? May 21st. May 21st. And so, mm -hmm. so it's happening. Yes. That'll be tomorrow if you're listening to this being published. I believe we're publishing this on May 20th. So tomorrow, this book is coming out, The Unconquerable Leader, Mastering the Internal and External Game. And it is just full of lessons that Nathan has learned along the way and compiled to, to help himself and now that he uses to help others. So. Let's talk about that. So Nathan, there's something that I loved about this, and you may talk about this with a lot of people when you get this started, but you tell a very vulnerable story at the beginning of the book in the introduction. And you say that this is the first time you've told the story to anybody else, and you just decided to tell it to the whole world. Yeah. So, so I start the book. This goes back to 2018. I am leading HR at DoorDash. This was the biggest job that I had had to that point. I joined DoorDash when there was about 250 employees, late 2016. Fast forward two years, we're at over a thousand employees. I've hired an excellent team. We're growing fast. It's an incredible environment. We've raised a bunch of money. Like the business is going very well. I am struggling individually. At work, I'm showing up. You know, I'm doing my job. Everything's going well there, but I'm stretched really, really thin. And it's work responsibilities that are stretching me. It's family responsibilities, church responsibilities. And I just, for, for months, I put my head down and was just like, I can get through this. I can get through this. We'll be okay. And I had this experience. It was my daughter's second birthday. It's a Sunday morning. I was sick. I had just, my role had just changed at work a little bit. I had sprained my ankle severely. So this long commute that I had been, you know, walking during a long portion of, I had to like redesign. I had, had all these setbacks and I didn't go to church that day. My family went off to church and like, I just needed to be alone. And I have this experience. I go into my room to pray, to meditate. And I just have this overwhelming, like panic feeling, just a, a strong panic attack where I just, I just lose control and I just break down crying. And I think it was just this release. I'd been bottling things up for so long and it just all came out. And during this moment, like my, my family's about to come back. I'm like, I don't want them to see me. I, I disappear. I get in the car. I drive off. I miss my daughter's second birthday, ice cream, cake, all of those things, presents. And I just realized like things need to change. Like I can't stretch any further. Things need to change. 
And I share that story because one, I've seen the clients that I work with face similar challenges where, you know, they have a major setback. And in the, and, and the, the book, the subtitle of the book is Mastering the, in, the Internal and External Game. And as a coach, when I became a coach, most of my focus, at least initially, was on the external game. And I describe the external game as how we show up with others. Are we delegating, setting expectations, giving difficult feedback, all of these skills that are very important, but it's how we show up and interact with others. And I found in working with leaders, yes, that is important, but the harder part to master is all of the stuff that's going on inside of us. The self-doubt, the lack of confidence, the stories that we tell ourselves, you know, emotional regulation, all of these things that influence how we lead, but other people don't see. And so I share this experience because like, that's when I realized I needed a change. And so many of my clients, I think have had a similar experience of like, yeah, I need to put in some more work. Like I need to put in the work to become a better leader and not just lead effectively at work, but to lead better at home, to show up as a, as a better human. So, yeah. Well, I really appreciate that. And as you describe that, that the internal game is important, it, it feels like you're describing me. <laughs> <laughs> saying like, oh my gosh, like I, I can show up and deliver and do the thing, but inside I feel like I'm a mess. I'm not good enough. I'm going to be found out, you know, that I'm putting yeah. on this mask of, of capability and I'm the expert and I can do this, but, but inside I am just freaking out. And, yeah. and, and that's, that's the experience I had. Like I went, but that was a Sunday. I went back to work on Monday and showed up as if it was any other day. And I found that so many of us are carrying that of like, we put the mask on and we just, we just move forward and push forward. And there can be some major consequences that come with that. Yeah. I feel like you got out by the skin of your teeth by taking, taking charge and, and finding a way to say that you, you want to make a change. And so how did you go about showing up different internally and externally after that experience? Yeah. So a couple of things. One of them, it's funny. I was actually in the process of becoming a coach when this so experience- This was in that place. transition of you- It, it was, what well, I mean, the from when I decided to become a coach to when it actually happened was a five to six year mm -hmm. experience. And so I, I wasn't, about to become a coach, but I was going through a coaching training and certification program at that time. And in my mind, I'm thinking, wait, how, <laughs> if, if my uh, cup is empty, how am I supposed to fill up the cup of, of others? And so I'm, I'm, I'm having that experience and I realized like, okay, I need to do more of this work myself. So I, I hired a coach who proved to be very, very effective and helping me handle some of these things. And also one of the other things is we had our, my wife and I, we had three kids at the time. Shortly thereafter, we had our fourth child and DoorDash's parental leave was very generous. And I took two full months off, which was more than I had taken with our first three kids. And, and it helped provide so much perspective, just completely pulling out of that because DoorDash was it was an incredible place, but it was so fast paced and just so many challenges all of the time. And like, that's where my head was, even when I wasn't at work, like that's where my mind was. And so, you know, pulling out provided a lot of perspective, which helped so that when I went back after parental leave and I'd done a lot of this work, I was able to just show up so much more effectively. So what was the the work like that you were doing? You had a coach that was helping you look in and, and take this, but especially having the two months to step back, zoom out, have new perspective. What are what are some maybe key experiences or is it is it a you know incremental changes? Yeah. One one of the things that I had to figure out, which we all do is the power of the stories that we tell mm. ourselves. And there's a lot of garbage stories that I've told myself over the years. I'm not smart you enough. Too? I'm not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, who hasn't? I'm not exactly. And for me, I had told myself a story for so long that my value to the organization wasn't in the skills or experiences I had, but was in pure effort. And so I was just the guy who showed up and did everything and raised his hand for everything. And I think that can work early on in your career as you start to grow. Just doing everything yourself doesn't scale at all. And it's like the fastest way to burn out. And so that was part of it. Health was another thing that I had to take charge of. Like I I wasn't exercising, I wasn't eating right. And so I set goals around my health that I wanted to improve in and setting aside more time for family as well and being more deliberate there was a, was a third. And so those were those were some of the key things that I really needed to to focus on to to turn things around. And it wasn't it wasn't an overnight thing by any stretch. You know, it's it's and quite frankly it's not something that you like get over and all of a sudden you just like get to the top of the mountain and you're done. You know, these are these are things that I'm still I'm still working on all the time. You know, I like that. I'm going to bring in something you talk about in the book, actually specifically when you bring in some fitness goals and some big, you know, achievements, hard things yeah. is and maybe get right into that is is choosing to challenge that story that you were telling yourself about how, you know, I can just put in all this effort, but then if that story is true, you have you're just taking everything on and I can do it all, but but at the cost of what else? At the cost of your health, your connection with family, or you, and you're spreading yourself thin. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and 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 these are. I mean, to, to give former Nathan a little bit of credit, like we're we're living in the Bay Area. Life is expensive. We're renting a house, hoping we can ultimately buy one. If I perform well in my job, there's promotion opportunities. Like, I, I don't want to. So many of the things I was pursuing were were good things, and were in the hope of providing for my family and helping us reach goals that were important to us. I just went too far in going down that route and just reached a point where I'm like, okay, I'm not, I'm not Superman, you know, like there, there are limits. And I don't think we really know what those limits are until we hit them and we're, we're lying on the floor and we need someone to help uh, peel ourselves off of it. Yeah. Yeah, so something that that you taught me and you you share in your book, which which now helps me ground myself every morning and just remember, okay, this is this is where we are, this is who I am, and to create a different story is, you know, a a, a list of daily reminders of of who I am and so on. Could you talk about that process a little bit and the importance of that? Yeah, so the the daily reminders I didn't really get into until I was launching the coaching business. And for me, there's an ident there was an identity change for lack of a better word, a shift in my identity that came from I am an HR leader to I am an executive coach. And so as a part of that, I had to create a new story and I had to view myself as a coach. And that that when we when we're making shifts in our identity and how we view ourselves, that takes time. And so I I had to do that. I had to come up with a, a list of things that I knew deep down that were true. And so some of them were, you know, my people can't afford not to to buy this. I am open to new opportunities. I add value to the world. I'd have to pull up the the full list. There were probably 10 of them and I would read these. I still do, you know, every day and that helped remind me who I am and who I want to be. And and I've seen this practice before with professional athletes, with top CEOs. It's it's a really powerful thing and just helps remind us of you know what we what we can do and I'm and I'm curious how how has maybe to to slightly shift it on you you've done some of this work Randy and if I can put you on the spot maybe you don't want to how, how is how has that helped you those reminders um, who's interviewing who here Nathan um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I broke the no, rule. I, I got you. I actually appreciate this a lot because my how you've helped me in our relationship. 
I'd love to share the impact of what you and I have been working on together. One of those is this this story that I tell myself that I'm creating rather than the the creative stories I come up with in my mind of of my limited beliefs, my you know where I I wrap my identity and things outside of my control. I had a tendency f- to to do that. And yeah. so so we we went through this. I actually took a a bit of time. I mean, it it took me a while, a couple of weeks really to pull this this list of things together. I was kind of mulling it over for a long time. And and then I just sat down and I said, okay, Randy, stop thinking about it. You know what these things are. And I wrote them all down in like three minutes. Okay. And it was- There was that much clarity. Yeah. And and so I'll read them to you. The, these are the my daily reminders that are impactful for me. They're important to me. Yeah. And I have 11 of them. Nathan, help me add the last one. I am consistent. I am honest. I am loyal. I am curious. I am enough. I have valuable knowledge and experience, and it's worth sharing. I have the humility and confidence to ask questions, and I will gain more wisdom by asking them. My future self is worth the sacrifice of temporary pleasures, and I will make decisions to enhance future growth. I value meaningful connections with those who matter most. I lead an exceptional estate planning team, and I have a successful podcast. And the last one is, why not me? So every morning when I read these, it's almost as if I have another version of myself telling me this, encouraging me of my value. Like it's my future self telling me this is true about you. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I feel that and it kind of, it, it peps me up in the morning. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's, there's, there's so much negativity that's out there. And I think our minds, you know, left, left to our own devices, we just go to that place but we have the power to fill our mind with positive things. Like what, whatever we put into our mind, that becomes our belief system. And that becomes really, really powerful. Yeah, I, I think for me, the the daily exercise, and we're, we're going to get into some of these daily practices that, that you preach and have adopted, and this being one of them, important to me that it's, that it's a daily practice because I'm so good at falling into the story and how often I... Yeah. I I, I fall into that. So so again, let me express my gratitude to you for helping me come up with that list. It, it means Absolutely. a lot and it's making a big change. Hello, everyone. I want to thank you so much for listening to the Sparks of Gratitude podcast. If you like what you're listening to, will you please hit that like, subscribe to this, and tell us what you like about it in the comments. That'll help us get great guests and keep this thing going. Now back to our interview. So uh, on the the topic of daily practices, you also talk about creating vision in in one of the chapters in your book. And I'd like to hear you share a little bit about the importance of that. And in part, because I have a little bit of guilt from the past. And, and maybe I'll share a story of, of something I need to make a confession. <laughs> I, I'm trying to wrap this in with the, the, the daily reminders of, you know, this identity that I want to become. And part of that, I think, in this in this grand horizon of setting a big vision. And so why, why is setting vision important to you? Our minds are very powerful. And the clearer the vision we create, the more likely it is we will get there. And I've seen this in others. Arnold Schwarzenegger is a great example of this. He grew up in a very small village in Austria. He wanted to be Mr. Universe, the best bodybuilder in the world. And in his mind, he was Mr. Universe. He set this vision for himself and he would picture himself like up on the stand with the trophy. And it was only a matter of time until that was going to happen. But he had a really, really difficult upbringing. His father was physically, mentally abusive to him. And he created these daily reminders. He created a reminder for himself And he said, he wrote down like, Arnold, you are a winner. And he would look at that every single day, every single day, even though the circumstances he was in at the moment or in his childhood were really, really negative. And I think that's the power of a a vision is being able to see several steps ahead of what's going to happen, what can happen, and then reminding yourself every day of what's it, what's it going to take? And you have clarity on who you want to be, where you want to go, 
and reminding yourself of that regularly gives you the the confidence, the courage to take the steps to get there. And I think when we, last thing I'll say on this is when we have that clarity of vision, our minds are unconsciously thinking about how we can, how we can achieve that, how we can get there. Kind of the universe opens itself up and creates a path to, to do that. Where if we don't have a vision, you know, we're, we're, we're meandering. I I love that. I had someone on the podcast the other day, Stephen Nyman. He's a professional. Well, he's no longer racing. He was on the U.S. ski team, downhill ski racer. You know, those courses are 100 miles an hour and he's still trying to go faster. <laughs> yeah. He said something about, you know, the stars align because you align the stars. And to me, setting this vision is in a way my attempt at aligning the stars, where if I put the vision out there, now all of a sudden I am I'm opening myself up to the possibilities that may come. Where if I if I close off the possibility of it, how is that going to occur unless unless I'm aiming at that horizon? And and so I think it's beautiful. And now now's where the confession that, that I wanted to make. In seventh grade, I went to this small private school. There was a one of the dads said he he, he wasn't comfortable sending his kids to the the public junior high. And so he started his own junior high. And so there was 30 kids in the entire seventh and eighth grade. And so we were all friends. We were friends by necessity because we were all we had. And it was awesome. I loved it for this the seventh and eighth grade years. But there was one of my classmates, his name was Mark, and he would write on his his notepads and on the the sides of the soles of his shoes on his white tennis shoes, things like, like, I am the best, I will succeed. And, you know, all these types of statements of, of what you are now coaching me to do in my late forties. And he was doing that as a 14 year old. And you know what? We would tease him, right? A younger version of me would say, oh, you know, what are you doing? You know, like, like it's kind of dumb. And, and now I think, oh man, like had I adopted that type of mindset and practice as a teenager, I'm grateful to be adopting it, you know, beginning in my 30s and 40s, <laughs> right, to, to some degree. But to be so intentional about that, I I look back and, and say, wow, how wonderful that he was doing that. And I'm a little, a little ashamed at, at, at teasing him about it. Yeah. Well, it, it requires a lot of courage to be able to do that. And sometimes when you, and this is one of, this is one of the challenges I've seen in coaching people. Often there are loved ones, friends who become uncomfortable. When people try to change who they are, sometimes it rubs people the wrong way. They think, wait, who are you? Or what? You think you're better than me? Or you don't need to change. You're, you're great. And, and I think that can be one of the challenges is there is, there is peer pressure. And so it does take, you know, whether it's Mark or you or any of the, the listeners here, it takes a level of courage to, to change. And that's, that, that's why we don't see it as much as we would like. It's, it's really, really difficult. And that's where I think having that mindset and having those reminders become really Yeah, could, maybe let's talk about that a little bit more because I see, yeah, courage to change. You also talk in some chapters of the book about, you know, getting, you know, the right people on the bus. You're, you're quoting Jim Collins and in, in his metaphor there, but also getting away from, from negative people or toxic people. And, and I wonder how that connects with this idea of when, when one is, is working towards that change and it makes other people uncomfortable because maybe they feel guilty that they're not doing it. I mean, I could make assumptions of what may be going on in, in their own minds, but, but what's your experience watching from your own experience or from your coaching clients going through that process? Yeah, I, I believe we're, I've heard this quote many times, we're the average of the five people we spend the most time with. And so you know, who we surround ourselves with is very important. And I've, I've found there are people who are really, really toxic and who want, when they see other people grow or do something good, it makes them uncomfortable and they want to bring that person down. I, I don't think it's, you know, half the population or a third of the population or anything like that. But I share this in the book and I spend a, a chapter on it sharing an experience I had recruiting a potential employee when I was at DoorDash because there's so much negative energy that can come from it. And it's such a drain on people that like when you see that, like 
push that person away. Like we, we, there, there isn't, there isn't room for that person. I'm not saying we surround ourselves with yes people who are just going to agree with everything we're doing, but like change is, change is difficult. And there may be time where it's like, oh, this friend I've had for 15, 20 years, like for me to become the person I want to be, I need to spend less time with this person or I may need to move on from this relationship. And that that is hard. That's challenging. Yeah. It is hard. And it, it takes, again, like you said, a, a type of courage to be able to do that one for myself, but also to know that what I might perceive as something I'm losing along the way by letting go of an old version of myself, old connections along the way, because I am sacrificing an old version of me to become a new one. That's hard. Yeah. And it's really hard. And, and, and this is where I talk about, I call it toxic authenticity. Mm, I love this. We care so much about being true to ourselves or, you know, that's just the way I am. I've always been that way. I, I know authenticity is a, is a is a popular and kind of a common word today, but I found it to be one of the most self-limiting words because when we're like, I, I don't know, think think about your uh, 12-year-old self who was with Mark back then in seventh grade. Like, do you want to be authentic to that version of yourself? Probably not. You know, like I, I when, so when I think about authenticity, it's holding on to the best of who we are while making room for a better emergence. Self. Right. And, and you call uh, that having authentic growth. Yes. I love it. I yeah. love that. I have that. That's the first thing I wrote down here on my notes right here. Authenticity, authentic mm -hmm. growth. I love that. And I appreciate so much that you share that. And it's, it's counter to what much of the world teaches of be true to yourself, you know, be, be who you are. It's like, I don't know, like I kind of rather would be better. I, I, I have goals and dreams and ambitions. I want to make progress towards those while still clinging to what is good uh, in who we are. And that, that leads me to something else you talk about where if we're doing all these things, we're setting those daily reminders, we're setting a vision, finding this uh, space for authentic growth personal responsibility take you know that accountability is something that you you have a an important chapter on maybe highlight that a little bit yeah so ownership and personal responsibility it's it's funny it was it's a value of many companies and it was a core value at the last three companies i worked at at doordash at neighbor and at linkedin they wanted employees who took ownership and so, and, and, and why do they want that? Because like, no one wants to work with someone who's just pointing out problems or who's saying, you know, that's, that, that's my job. I, I, I had this experience. I was leading performance reviews at DoorDash. There's a thousand employees at the company. We used this new software tool that was going to gather all of the feedback from employees. And we had promised employees, I had promised employees that this was going to be anonymous. So let's say I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a manager or I'm getting feedback from me. You're my boss. You get feedback. Uh, you're gathering feedback from my peers, my direct reports. You have feedback. All of that goes into the system and is supposed to be shared with me anonymously. Well, the day we were supposed to confirm that the tool works the way it did, I was dealing with some other problem and I had a, a direct report of mine who was responsible for this and I couldn't get to it. He said it was good. He checked it the next morning after this tool went live and all of the feedback was shared out. I woke up to 20 different emails from angry employees because whoops, that feedback isn't, wasn't anonymous. That feedback was transparent. All of the names who said what were shared and now people are angry. And they're like, well, if I knew my name was going to be attached to that, maybe I wouldn't have shared that feedback. And I was hit with uh, my initial reaction, kind of the fight or flight response was, I'm mad at my direct report because they messed up. And like, oh no, like how am I going to save face with my boss who's now going to be mad at me and everyone else? And, you know, I thought about this personal responsibility and ownership value. And I'm like, you know what? I, I, I can't throw this person under the bus. First off, I hired this person. So 
It's on me anyway. I should have been there to check this person's work and make sure that it happened. And I need to go have a direct conversation with my manager. So I reached out to her and I'm like, I messed up big time. This is on me. No one else. Here's how I'm going to fix it. I'm going to send an email to the company, explain what happened. She was very unhappy with me in the moment, as you can, as you, one can expect. I came back after she'd approved the plan a half an hour later, and she said, Nathan, I'm actually really glad this happened. Yes, you messed up big time, but I'm glad this happened because this is moving our company forward where we can have more direct conversations and we're not going to hide behind anonymous feedback. And I don't think if I, if I would have tried to hide my mistake or pretend like it was someone else, like I think that plays out very, very differently. And at times as a, as a society, as individuals, there can be a victim mindset. Like so many of us have gone through really, really challenging problems and we can make excuses for why things haven't worked out the way we want them to, or why he or she is to blame for this, but that doesn't get us anywhere. That doesn't help us grow. And so taking responsibility for our actions and the outcome of our actions is the only way to go. Yeah, I that's pretty brave too. I mean, courage and bravery keep coming up in this conversation, but that's a pretty brave thing to do to take that responsibility. And it seems that even though it was extremely uncomfortable, that it played out sooner and better than it otherwise could have. Yeah, I guess in full candor, there is a scenario where I end up losing my job. Uh, so, so you know, I, I, I don't want to be too, yeah. uh, you know, be, be, be too you're, you're not making promises it. to everybody out there that's like I'll just tell my boss it was my fault. It's like good now you lost your job. Yeah, but but, but for for me it was the right thing to do and it was aligned with, it was aligned with our values mm. as well. And it was a it was it was a mistake. It was a big mistake, but it was a mistake and we and we were able to move forward. From it. Well, you you mentioned that sometimes it's easy to take that role of you know this is somebody else's fault and often it is right? Sometimes it is someone else's fault. Sometimes we are hurt or inconvenienced in some way because of something someone else did. And we are justified in feeling like we're a victim of that. And this is where, to me, I mean, at the heart of the purpose of this podcast is to spread the principle and practice of gratitude because it's the cure. I believe that it is the opposite of that resentment and victimhood mentality. And if we live a life of gratitude and personal responsibility, it, it permits me to, to see beyond that, that I'm a victim. It, it permits me to take personal responsibility and even see possibility and gratitude in the hard stuff. You have a chapter where you talk about counting your blessings. And I'd like to hear your story of, of how that impacted you, how you do it, why that means so much to you. Yeah, it all started, it was like a random Friday. And I came home really frustrated after work. And it was a couple of small things. I wish I could point to something big, but it wasn't. I was just like bothered by a bunch of things. And I looked at my house and my family and all these things. And this lens I had on, just everything looked negative. And I was like, oh, I need to get out of this. I want to I wanna change here. And so I was reading a book that talked about how gratitude can lead to increased happiness. And then that weekend, there were lots of talks and messages that were given talking about the importance of gratitude. And I was struck with this idea of like, I'm going to try this 30 day gratitude challenge. And I had a blog and I'm like, once every day, I'm going to write a quick blog post and just share what I'm gra grateful for and why. And I'm kind of using this blog post to like hold me accountable and and do that. And I'm like, hopefully by the end of it, you know, it will have been uh, had been positive. And so I did that, and I, I learned a bunch of lessons. I won't go into all of them, but like, yes, consistently giving thanks did lead to an increase in happiness for sure. I'm one. I'm probably the only one in the world who is like this, but I tend to compare myself to others. Yeah, I assure you, nobody uh, else does that. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's just me. I'm glad it's just me. And, and I found that, you know, gratitude was, was the antidote to comparison. 
And by expressing gratitude in the things I have, it was helpful. And it, and one day, one of the posts I talked about, like this house we lived in, we had three kids, a small home, we're in the Bay Area renting. And there were a lot of things I didn't like about it. And I'm like, let's flip this. Let's look at only the things I am grateful for. And I'm like, well, it's kind of cool. You can vacuum the entire house without having to change the outlet, you know, of the, of the vacuum cord. That's pretty cool. And, you know, there was also one night I heard our, our young kids, they were in, in bunk beds and I heard, it was like, it's really quiet in there. Normally it's a little bit louder. And like one of them had climbed into the bed of the other one and they were just like, you know, whispering and telling stories. And I'm like, oh, this is a really special experience where like, if all of our kids had our own room, we wouldn't have this. And so I, I tried at times to focus on on gratitude. And at, at the end of this 30 days, I shifted to like, okay, I'm just going to write one thing down every day that I'm grateful for and why. Very, very quick exercise. And I've done that every day. I actually, I, I checked. It's been a little over seven years. It's like 2,000 380 days or something like that. And and today I wrote, I'm grateful that we're having this conversation. Like genuinely, that's what I wrote. And so just, I can't think of, it sounds silly to say this, but like I can't think of a better habit that has a better like ROI, return on investment than like pausing and thinking about something you're grateful for. And sometimes they're really, really small and even silly. And sometimes it's hard to keep up, come up with something, but like, it's become such a powerful habit uh, for me. You know what I observe when you say that is is give yourself a little more credit that you say that sometimes there's something small. What I noticed from our whole conversation thus far in the last 30 plus minutes, you've talked about some really difficult moments. You've talked about panic attacks. You've talked about wondering if you're going to lose your job because you made this big mistake and everybody's mad at you and others. And you're saying it to me with a smile and gratitude for the lesson that you learned from that. This is hard stuff, but I would say that that this practice or just looking at the world through a lens that permits you to see that, I think that beginning with a practice of gratitude opens up the possibility for me to find it in the hard stuff. And and I I observe that you you see that. You see the, the blessings in the hard stuff the tiny apartment that, yeah, if you want to find something wrong with it, you sure can. But guess what? You can find something right with it. Look yeah, for it. Absolutely. And, and I, and one, one thing I want to call out, like there are, I have been through some challenges in my life. There are people who have gone through very, very extreme traumatic challenges. And, and, and in no way do I want to say like, let's just be happy. You know, let's just focus on the positive. That's not it. It's having having a heart of gratitude. And sometimes it may take years, but being able to think, okay, what might I be grateful for from this experience? Or what what might I take away from this, even though it's not what I asked for? Yeah, I have had a few people on this podcast who... We talk about the importance of that and finding gratitude in the hard stuff. Mm. And I'm I'm not grateful for the hard thing, but I'm grateful for what could come from it. <laughs> you know, exactly. you're not grateful for the exactly. cancer. You're grateful. I'm not grateful for the person dying, but I'm grateful that I'm closer to that person because as a result of something that occurred. Right. So it's a pretty powerful mindset. And again, like I'll I'll just preach this. Guys, we're never going to stop. You're listening to the podcast. You know what? This is what we're going to talk about. If you live with a heart of gratitude or you're you're leaning into that, it's hard to live in resentment and selfishness. And it's easier to move into personal accountability and open yourself up for joy. And joy does not mean lack of pain or challenge, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So something else that, that is one of my most meaningful values, and in fact, this kind of goes back to when you and I very first met, is, is meaningful connection. And 
you, you talk a little bit about communication and how important that is and how we can connect with people. I'm going to kind of go that route, but maybe a different, uh, a little different, but, but when I was introduced to you and we talk on the phone the first time and learn about, well, Randy, what, what do you want out of a coaching relationship? And I said, well, when this coaching relationship is over, we are going to be, we're, we're going to be deeply connected. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I'm opening up. You better be ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to connect deep. And you said, well, I'm going to be in town. You want to get together and talk? I'm like, yes. And how did we do that? <laughs> we did a cold, cold plunge and sauna. Yeah, let's let's get cold and, and get in the sauna and sweat together and talk and open up. And it was so fun for me. But I love creating opportunities to, to be able to open up and connect intentionally with people. And I knew mm -hmm. if if we were going to have any success in our relationship, we needed to be able to connect and communicate and be honest. Yes. Yes. And something you talk about in your book is about communication and depending on the, the setting or the size of the, the enterprise that that communication may look different, but it's very easy to have assumptions that communication is happening. <laughs> but so, so what might you have to say about communication, especially when it might be communicating the hard stuff. Yeah. Giving feedback can be very, very challenging. I mean, there, there, there are entire books that are written about giving difficult feedback and how, how challenging that can be. And so I think that, you know, there are several tools that I talk about in the book. The most important in my opinion, starts with the relationship. So I use the Radical Candor framework. It's a book from Kim Scott. It's a really, really powerful framework where in order to give difficult feedback and, and have it be received well, two things are required. One is that you show the individual that you care personally. And the second is that you're willing to challenge them directly. And the care personally, I don't think gets enough emphasis. The importance of that relationship. So when people hear what you have to tell them, do they know you're doing it because you care about them and you want to see them get better? But we also have to challenge directly at times. And we also have to have these difficult conversations. And they're, they're not fun. And there are various tools that can you know empower you to do that. But it's really a combination of those two things of like, do we show that we care that, care about this person as an individual, as a human? And then are we actually willing to, to challenge them on it? Are we willing to have the hard conversations? Yeah, well, that that is one of my favorite books. And it's also one of the most challenging things that, that I do. I like to say that I adopt that. I, I think I spend more of my effort trying to build that connection and less of my effort having the direct conversations because it's hard. But you know what? If I care about somebody enough, I'm willing to have that difficult conversation. And and I appreciate you being kind enough to to ask me good questions and challenge my my assumptions in our relationship. Yes. So well so much of it this this may be a tangent, Randy, but but and this gets back to growth, generally speaking. So much about growth and personal transformation requires the individual to be ready. And there are a lot of times where I meet people who say, yeah, I need to improve in this area, in this area, I'm ready. And then we start working together and it's like, you made this commitment, but you didn't do it. You said you're going to do this, but you didn't do it. And the reality is, and I don't, I don't, I don't think ill of them, they weren't ready to make those changes. When we started working together, you were ready. You took action on everything you were invited to, to take action on. And, and I, I think that's a really key thing of like, sometimes people just don't want feedback. <laughs> they're not, they're not receptive to it. And that's where, that's where growth dies. We don't want to, to be there, but there does need to be a willingness to, to grow and to change. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And for all of you people out there who are willing to grow, who are eager to improve, become a better version of yourself, check out Nathan's book. It comes out tomorrow. It's called The Unconquerable Leader. And we will link to it in the description there. And Nathan, I'm so grateful you spent some time with us on my show today. Yes. You know, uh, well, thank, 
Thank you so much for having yeah, me. Yeah, I appreciate that so much. Nathan, is there is there any place that other than me linking to Amazon or something like that where where we send people to look up your book? Yeah, take take a look at the book if you found anything interesting in this conversation. Also, I'm at nathantanner.net. I'm also on LinkedIn. Say hi. Would love to love to say hi. Would love to connect. And yeah, thank you very much for uh, for having me. This was a really fun conversation. And kudos to you for putting in the real work. The work you're doing on this podcast is really important. It's making a big impact on people's lives, and it it requires courage. And uh, I, I I tip my hat to you for uh, for being in the arena and making it happen. Thank you, Nathan. I will take that endorsement and use that to say, hey guys, if you believe what Nathan says which I hope you do, people listen to podcasts that have good ratings. And so why don't you go on there and if you're watching on YouTube, like it and subscribe to it. Give us a rating and a comment. It really helps. And we can find awesome people like Nathan to have this conversation with again. And we will see you all next time. We're grateful for you. Talk soon.